short days, cold nights, and the holiday season. It's the perfect time for hot cocoa, hot toddies, and of course, hot spiced rum. The recipe in this month's column is from Jerry Thomas's classic 1862 book, How to Mix Drinks. And I thought I'd give it a try. So I've got everything we need right in front of us, including the star of the show, which of course is the rum. We'll come back to that in just a minute. This recipe is fairly simple, like I said, and so it's just got a few ingredients. Um, I've got a few of them already in here. Uh, one of the other stars of the show, of course, is the spices. So Thomas actually specifies in his recipe that it's uh, mixed spices, and he says it's a mixture of cloves and allspice. So I had some of those in my house, so I went ahead, mixed them, crushed them, gave them a good shake. He says about one teaspoonful, so I put that in here. Also, of course, like many cocktails, some type of a sweetener, and Thomas says to use a teaspoonful of sugar, so I've got that in here. Now, of course, another big star of the show in this cocktail is the butter. Uh, and so here's where the units get really fun, because in Thomas's recipe, how much butter does he say? a measurement I've never seen before. Uh, he says to use half a chestnut of butter. I admit to having no idea how much butter that would be, so I went down a bit of a rabbit hole of butter and chestnuts, and it turns out it's about a tablespoon, which is what you find in many modern recipes. Now, of course, want to remember that Definitely back in 1862, the butter wasn't refrigerated. So one of the easy things, especially in modern recipes, is to make sure that the butter is at room temperature is what a lot of recommendations are for recipes. So that's in here, ready to go. And of course, really, we've got to pick a rum because you've probably noticed that I've got an array of rums ahead of me here. Now, Thomas is very specific in his recipe and he says, Jamaican rum. And here's another fun unit. He says one wine glass full. Don't panic. A wine glass is not as much as it sounds because it sounds like a whole lot. Well, it turns out that back then uh, a wine glass was probably about two ounces. So that's as much rum that's in each one of these shot glasses. Now, which rum to choose? Well, We've got a lot of options. Modern recipes, much like they specify for a single serving about a tablespoon of butter, they often usually say to use golden rum or dark rum. Okay? And the thought is that if it is golden to kind of, you know, an amber, golden brown color, it's been aged longer. The thinking is, is that if you have white or silver or Blanco, depending on how it's marketed, rum, it is straight from the still into the bottle, no aging at all. And if you've got these beautiful kind of golden amber colors, that it's been aged, and the darker the color, the longer it's been aged, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> Turns out that it could be that the oldest one is actually the white rum. There are plenty of manufacturers that barrel age their rums and by specification, by some legal guidelines, depending on where you're at, is that the rum is going to be aged, if it's aged at all, in barrels that were used to age previously, whiskey, bourbon, sometimes brandy. And those barrels in particular are typically made out of American oak or French oak. So throw the rum out of the steel if you're going to age it into the barrel for some amount of time. Okay, let's say that you did that and then you filtered it. Well, if you filter it, you're going to filter out some of those flavor compounds, some of the compounds that also depart the beautiful smell and of course that color it. So it could be that the white one is actually the oldest one, it's just been filtered. Now, why would someone do that? Well, maybe they wanted some of the parts of the aging process 
some of the flavors and the compounds that come out of that barrel, but they don't want them all. They want a very, they have a very specific uh, taste that they want, a very, very specific uh, scent, uh, mouthfeel, all of those things. And so they go through some type of filtering step to get you an aged white rum. Right? Now, what I will reveal is that this white rum that I have is not aged. So if you've read the article or hopefully uh, read my write-up of it, um, so the research article and then this one's column, you'll know that there was some interesting findings with the unaged rum that they could in fact identify it or the, the sample they had, it looked a bit different. It was kind of off the data cluster from some of the other samples. So this one, according to the manufacturer and the information on the bottle and the company's website, is in fact not an aged rum. It is straight from the still into the bottle. So I'm not gonna go with that one because again, a lot of the recipes call for a golden rum or an aged rum. Not quite sure what Thomas called for because you could absolutely have a Jamaican rum that is straight from the still to the bottle and not aged. But let's just say we're gonna go with one of our two kind of golden colored rums. Well, hmm, which one to go with? Well, this one is clearly older than that one. No, <laughs> it might be, um, but just like some manufacturers might filter things out, others might add things in. And not just disreputable folks that are trying to fake an aged rum, which is also a problem in the counterfeit realm because, you know, aging takes time and time is money. And so if you really wanted to try to fake it and uh, get all of the benefits of the age, and by benefits, I mean the profit, uh, but not have to actually do any of the work, you might actually, uh, if you were a bit of a chancer, <laughs> con person, uh, that you might actually kind of fake it and add different flavoring agents, maybe even add sugar, uh, potentially again, add a, a compound that chemists food chemists will know well, which is caramel coloring. Uh, so you can't actually go by the color. Now, it's not only people that are flim flamming that add color. There are some manufacturers that make no bones about coloring. They'll put that, yes, something was added, some flavor was added, not just the flavored rums, but in a variety of brown liquors, you might actually add coloring if you're a manufacturer, if you're trying to quote, even out the color distribution between batches, that would be a very technical way to say, you want all your stuff to look the same and what people expect it to look like. That might be one, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, these are both, these are two different rums by, you know, two different manufacturers and they're both labeled dark rum. So, Maybe it's possible that one of the manufacturers was like, hmm, doesn't seem dark enough. Hmm. <laughs> there could be a lot of reasons, uh, but we can't judge a whiskey or a rum uh, or a wine by its color, right? There has been a lot of cases where you've got spirits fraud. So in this case, and like this paper, you want to look a little bit deeper. Right, And so the researchers in this particular case uh, were able to look at a bunch of different factors. Now, one thing, of course, is that narrowing it down to the country of origin was a bit tricky, but they were able to learn some things about aging, right, and about what type of barrel it was, which were really cool, and also the starting material. So, you know, was it sugarcane? Was it molasses? Which, again, really interesting finding. Now, both of these rums, I like both of them, but I'm actually going to pick this one to go with because I think the sample would be really fun to analyze using the researcher's technique, the researchers of the paper that's featured in this month's column. And why is that? Well, it turns out that this rum here is called 10 to 1, and it is marketed as a Caribbean dark rum. 
Uh, and the reason why I thought it would be a fun sample to look at is because if we use the information on the bottle, like the researchers did and from the companies themselves, right, all the information available at the product, uh, then in the paper they were able to say, okay, what's the country of origin? How long has it been aged for according to the manufacturer? What kind of barrel it came in? And it turns out that this particular product is a blended rum, which is pretty common in rums um, as they go, which is the reason why I thought sample-wise it would be really fun to analyze. Um, it's also reported to be aged for eight years. So this could potentially definitely be binned or classified into a particular cluster of samples as we saw in the research paper, right? And if it says eight years, Maybe we expect it to be binned with the samples that were aged seven years and longer. So that's one reason why I picked it. And again, the blending was another because it's from four different countries. You have rums from Trinidad, one of the countries looked at by the researchers. Barbados, which wasn't listed specifically in the paper. Jamaica, which is another country researchers looked at and Dominican Republic, another country of origin for one of the rums. So I thought that would be interesting. What if they took a sample of this one? We know that it was a real struggle to kind of figure out, you know, narrow it down to country in the research article. Now, maybe that's because, um, you know, what contributes the most variance isn't actually the nation, right? They, the nation of origin. Maybe, like the researchers say, it's actually more about kind of the overall process, the starting materials that they used, um, and also the barrel. Now, this one, according to the company, is um, X bourbon barrels, uh, American, they say X American bourbon barrels, uh, which means it's probably, probably American oak, uh, which would be white oak. Uh, just based on kind of what the, the industries tend to use. Now, the other interesting thing here is that three of the four countries, according to the manufacturer, use one distillation technique, and then one of these countries uses a different distillation technique. So that would be really interesting if researchers looked into that. So according to the manufacturer of 10 to 1 rum, uh, the countries of Trinidad, Barbados, and Dominican Republic, the rums that they, those specific rums that they used were column stills. Uh, so chemists should definitely know what those look like. And then the Jamaican rum was produced using a pot still, looks like a kettle. Uh, so I think that would be really fun if they analyzed this sample and, and kind of saw what the data looked like. Now, what I also like about this one, because I am an allergal chemist, as many chemists would also appreciate, is it's got a bunch of data on the side here, uh, which I just love. It's got the product of it, tells you where all the rums were from in the mixture. It also tends, tells you a kind of a blend serial number and the batch number. And as someone who has written down many, many lot numbers in my day, I really appreciate that extra bit of data there. And if you go onto the company's website, it gives you all that other information about aging, the type of barrel, the types of distillation that were used. And I love that level of detail. It kind of, as a consumer, also gives me a bit of confidence. They're being quite transparent in their process, which when we're double checking all of our gifts and purchases this holiday season and any time of the year is, you know, kind of sometimes the best you can get when it comes to security. So let's throw the rum in here. Okay, because you know you might read this column, think about the counterfeiting that we always run into, and, and how are we supposed to know if this is a good rum or that one's a flim flam, or you thought you were buying an aged silver and it's not. I'm an analytical chemist, and even I don't have instruments in my house that would allow me to do the type of analysis these researchers did. All I can do is do what I did and look at the company's website, check out the bottle. I bought it from a, a reputable distributor, um, from a legal you know, shop, and that's all we can do sometimes, right? Is, is try to you know, put a little faith in the process and in the people and you know, kind of go from there. So Thomas's recipe, we've got spices, butter, rum, all in there. And the next 
important ingredient, Thomas says, is to top it with hot water, which I've got here. That will definitely help with melting butter, right? It smells so good. I wish we had smell-o-vision. Um, so I'll put that there and stir it on up. So this holiday season, all we can do is the best we can with buying any of our gifts and products. And, you know, I think I'm going to put my faith in the sellers, that it's, you know, reputable company, read the reviews. Maybe it's the holiday spirit. Maybe it's just holiday cheer. But I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and think that it's all on the up and up. Now, this smells delicious, and I can't wait to try it. Cheers. Cheers.